Paris is a city that's full of different little quarters and neighborhoods. You've certainly heard of the Latin Quarter, you know about the Gay District, and you've surely heard about the Jewish Quarter too. But I got to thinking. In the heart of the Marais is the Jewish Quarter of Paris, and its history is fascinating yet somewhat mysterious to me. I realized I didn't really know much about the Jewish Quarter of Paris and what goes on there. Is it a quarter where Jewish people go to get Jewish food and pray Jewish prayers? Is it a quarter where everybody can go regardless of where they're from or what they believe in? What's behind the closed doors of the synagogue and why is that falafel shop so popular? You know which one I'm talking about, the green one on Rue de Rosier, Las du Falafel. With all this in mind, I figured I would dig a little bit deeper, talk to some experts, sample the Jewish Quarter for myself, and share it with you guys. My name is Oliver G. This is the Earful Tower Podcast, and J is for Jewish Paris. There's a little music, a little fitting music actually from Press Max and I'll talk about that more in a second. First, this is a very different topic to uh, my usual topics because it's uh, it's a tricky one. It reminded me of going back to my old journalist days because I wanted to get it right and I wanted to talk to people who knew things, people I wanted to talk to the right people. I didn't want to just uh, go out there by myself and sort of report back. And yet, last week's episode, Walking Around the Island, hit some kind of chord with a lot of you, so I did want to experience it for myself. So what you're about to hear is a collection of interviews with various people uh, from uh, Paris's Jewish scene, mixed in with me going and doing all these things, experiencing it for myself so I can share with you things to do while you're in the Jewish quarter of Paris. Crucially, I think this is... An episode that can be, uh, I don't know, enjoyed, hopefully, by everybody, whether you're Jewish or not. I was careful not to go too, here's something for the Jewish people coming to Paris. And I didn't want to go too far into, uh, if you're not Jewish, this is what it means, which is a delicate balance. And hopefully I walked the line perfectly. But where do you start when you want to visit Jewish Paris? Not least knowing it's August and everything's closed and everyone's away. I figured I'd turn to my trusty friend, Edith de Belleville, who uh, long-term listeners of this podcast will remember. She voiced Edith Piaf for us not that long ago. Uh, She's also a licensed tour guide and author and an expert on Jewish Paris. So I got chatting to her. I actually had a long chat to her before uh, either of us pressed record. And given she's out of Paris at the moment, I said, can you answer this question for me? on the microphone and I said how should I spend a day in Paris to start to understand Jewish Paris here's what she answered hi Oliver it's a difficult question But I have few addresses for you. First of all, you have to know that France is the third country in the world where there is the biggest Jewish community. First is Israel, of course. Second is United States. And third is France with 450,000 Jews. So to start, I would visit the magnificent Jewish Museum, Musée d'Art et Tradition du Judaïsme. It's in Le Marais. Everything is in Le Marais. It's a magnificent museum because it used to be a 17th century mansion. So they have a beautiful courtyard and you will learn everything about the Jews in France from uh, since antiquity. They have uh, their medieval graves. They talk about the links of the French Revolution and the Jews, Napoleon and the Jews, the 19th century history of the Jews in France, even Roaring Twenties artists like Chagall. So very interesting museum. 
Of course, when we think about Jewish heritage in Paris, we have to think about the sad side of story, which is the Second World War and the story of the 76,000 Jews deported and arrested in France and deported to Auschwitz, among them 11, more than 11,000 children. So I would advise you to visit the Shoah Memorial, the Holocaust Memorial. It's extremely moving. When you will leave, you will see the right house wall with the names of the French who are not Jewish and who saved the Jews. More than 75% of Jews in France were saved, which is a high rate if you compare with other countries in Europe. And of course, as we are in France, I have to talk about food, the Jewish food. So it's the mythical Rue des Rosiers, still in the Marais, that with the nickname is Pletzel, which is uh, in Yiddish means the little place where you have, alors, now there are less and less Jewish kosher, butcher, kosher bakeries and etc. because with the phenomenon uh, that we know, which is the gentrification, but there are still good places. My favorite is a Finkelstein, which is the yellow bakery in the Rue des Rosiers. All the pastries from Eastern Europe, uh, Apfelstrudel, it's a pastry from Austria with a cinnamon and apples, or cheesecake, not the New York cheesecake, the real cheesecake, very thick, and all the pastries from Eastern Europe. There is also Florence Can, which is near. A Florence Can, it's more a delicatessen, meaning there is a salted food from Eastern Europe. It's written on the wall, Yiddish uh, delicatessen. You can see it, which is uh, convenient, and it's a good place. If you want to try the oriental pastries from uh, Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco, I would advise you to go in the kosher bakery, uh, Sephardic bakery, Murciano. Excellent and cheap, not too expensive pastries with a lot of honey. And of course, I have to talk about the iconic place, uh, As du Falafel, which is the best place to eat the best falafel of Paris. Falafel is a Mediterranean meal. But there are also falafel, many falafel in Israel. There is two options. Either you do the line and uh, take away or you go inside. Uh, you have to know that you cannot reserve and it's closed on Saturday because it's a kosher restaurant. Me, I prefer to eat inside. I tell you why. I don't know how to eat a falafel while I'm walking. Half of my fal I tried once. It was a bad idea because half of my falafel was on the floor and I, it was good for the Parisian pigeon, but not for me. So if you're clumsy like me, I would advise you to go inside. The line is quite quick. Go early. And inside it's great. There are not only falafels, there are other things. Uh, and you have, there is the Israeli music, a lot of mood. I like this place, as many people. Huh? Be aware, you have to do the line. Huh? But it's worth. Voila, it's uh, my addresses about how to spend, enjoy, have experience of a Jewish uh, heritage in Paris. Thank you, bye-bye, au revoir. So there's the inside word from Edith de Belleville. She's linked in the show notes below if you want to book a tour of Paris with her, especially Jewish Paris. But basically three things to do. Go to the restaurant, go to the Shoah Memorial, and go to the Jewish Art Museum, none of which I think I've done before. Uh, and I figured I'd set out to do them. And my first idea was to start with lunch. But first, that music you've been hearing, I want to give a few uh, sentences to it from Press Max and our maestro. He said, I can't think of a better artist to represent Jewish Paris than Yael Naim. I have to recommend her eponymous album from 2007, covered a song from this album last season. She's Israeli, born in Paris, and sings in Hebrew, French, and English. I chose the song Yashanti for this week's podcast episode because it's beautiful. But it feels deeper than that. It's a love song in Hebrew, but the music just perfectly reflects the feeling in the song. 
the balance of hope and heartbreak, love and loss. Hope and heartbreak, love and loss. Now that seems like, um, well, it's just perfect for this episode. But starting on a brighter note, I didn't want to lose my chance at tasting some of this uh, famous falafel. Like imagine going up to this uh, restaurant, Las Du Falafel. When you go there and you see out the front, it's got pictures of celebrities. If you follow them on Instagram, Leonardo DiCaprio, Adam Sandler, Pharrell Williams, uh, all these big names. I've visited this place fairly recently too, and uh, I figured this was a good place to start to see what the fuss is about. So now we're leaving the home studio and walking down Rue de Rosier, one of my favorite streets in Paris. Imagine you're there with me. But maybe you don't need to imagine, because before I could even get started, I noticed these guys that stand on Rue de Rosier that wear the black hats and they're wearing suits and... Uh, They're Jewish people representing Chabad, which is an Orthodox Jewish Hasidic dynasty and one of the world's best known Hasidic movements. And he was playing a ram's horn. So that is where this conversation is going to start before the falafel shop. Here we go. Let's start with some ram's horn. I'm sorry to interrupt. I need to ask you what you were just playing then. Okay, so that is called the shofar. And traditionally, we play it on Rosh Hashanah. That's the Jewish New Year. This month that we're in now, it's called Chodesh Elul, the month of Elul. And that's like a preparation before Rosh Hashanah, before the Jewish New Year. So every day during the month of Elul, we blow the shofar, which is the mitzvah of Rosh Hashanah. This is the ram's horn, which we blow on Rosh Hashanah. And we blow it during this month as like a preparation to let everyone know that we're kind of preparing and getting ready for this month, for the time of Tishrei, Rosh Hashanah. And, and it was actually, it looked like actually a ram's horn you were blowing there. Where did that go? Yeah. That's just a ram's horn. Did you have to learn to play it? So, traditionally it's given to kids and they kind of just pick it up from uh-huh. a young age. Uh-huh. They play with it a bit, they try sucking it, thing, until they're able to let out a sound, until they're able to let out a nice tune. All right, well you played it very beautifully. Yeah. One question before I, uh, before I leave you to it. No problem. Um, this is like a traditional Jewish part of Paris. Of course, yeah. uh, How does everyone react when you're blowing that horn? I saw someone came out of his shop next door and had a look at you. Is this something that... Um, I guess people are definitely surprised. It's not the general thing that you'd see in the middle of Paris, someone blowing a horn. But um, it's actually very beautiful for a lot of the tourists that come here and they get the to- taste of Israel, the taste of Rosh Hashanah, the taste of Judaism here in Paris. Okay. Uh, and behind you is the synagogue, right? Yeah. A couple hundred years old? Yeah. May I have a look at it? Of course, of course. Just Take a look. Follow those guys in there? Yeah. Okay. And you said 10, you said 10 minute wait for the last two for that. I think something like that. So now I'm walking down the Rue de Rosier, learning things along the way, and uh, this is like the heart of the Jewish quarter of Paris, and there's always a huge queue to get into this Las Du Falafel. And I'm standing here looking at now, there's a queue, there must be 40 people going off to the left, and there's another queue, like the VIP queue, VIP queue going at least... 25 people to the right so I don't even know what queue to get into let's see if I can just walk straight in let's see what happens Bonjour. Uh, uh, you speak English? Yeah, do you want I'm, to sit? Take yeah, I'm um, yeah. doing a story about Jewish Paris. I'm a, okay. I'm a podcaster from Australia. Big story, and everybody told me I have to see this place. How long is this line going to go for? And if it's really long, can I just go in and have a look? Here's the guy who created this restaurant. Okay, so okay, so I'll talk to him. If, to talk him. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Yeah, right and left. Maybe, yeah. Sunday you come. Okay. Sunday, 12 or 12 p.m., it's okay. 12 with you. No, not with me, with uh, the boss. You can come back Sunday, it's okay? Yeah, yes, hopefully always. it's okay, yeah. This is the, like the, the boss will be here. Thank you. want to tell you everything you know. Thanks, Thank man. You. So I gotta be honest, it's very, very, very seldom that I try to jump queues uh, in Paris or throw my name around. But this time I think I had to give it a shot and it worked. Super busy, super busy, but uh, super friendly guys. So I must admit, 10 people working in now. 
uh, and had a quick look and they said to come back on Sunday to chat with the big boss man. But I had a look inside. I mean, if you've never been here before, it says there's a, it's, a, it's, a green, it's quite a beautiful green building. Uh, and then on the door, all these awards that they've won. Uh, and inside, people crowded around tables. Apparently, space for 110 people in there. Thank you very much. Thank you very And so now I walk out with a falafel with everything on it and spicy, apparently. And I think the perfect way to add a little personal touch to this, the perfect way to uh, enjoy the, this part of the Maori, the Rue de Rosier and beyond, is to find my favorite secret little hidden park. Uh, featuring the Philip August Wall. I'll tell you something else. Is it's a different, uh, a different perspective on the city. Like, I saw tour guides talk about the Philip August Wall, but they also talk about how, uh, when it was built, the king at the time, King Philip August, expelled all the Jews inside Paris to be outside of the wall. And uh, even, I mean, as a, I just stopped now on Rue de Rosier because there's a sign here out the front of a restaurant, uh, the restaurant Goldenberg which in 1982, uh, someone threw a grenade in there and killed six people and injured 22 people. And their names are written out the front. And it was on the 9th of August, so there are flowers piled out the front. But uh, now, if I turn in this way to the Joseph Minieri garden and walk through the, this is one of my favorite parts of Paris, walk through this sort of half-timbered little entranceway, uh, and right before the tower of the Philip August Wall, there's a big sign on the wall, and it says uh, that more than 11,400 children were deported from France between 42 and 44 and assassinated in Auschwitz because they were born Jewish. More than, and I'm translating as I go here, more than 500 of these children lived in the fourth arrondissement, among them 100 very young children who never had the chance to even go to school. Uh, and then there's the list of names, there must be, maybe there's all the hundred of these young names, some of them as young as one, Henry Borkowska, one year old, all their names, oh my gosh, Jean Stolowitz, 11 months old, um, just absolutely chilling, and at the end, never forget. <laughs> So here's what we're going to do. If uh, I do get to meet the owner on uh, Sunday at midday, then uh, we'll play that part of the interview at the end of this episode. But for now, I'm just taking one last look around this amazing uh, park of Rue de Rosier with birch trees lying down the middle of the Philip August wall. I just snuck into the composting section at the back to have a double check. Looks to me like the wall around along the back of the park. Fig trees... Quince trees, vegetables, really beautiful little park. Um, and if you have been here and you think, oh, this is, this is old news, old news, Oliver. Well, let me tell you something that you probably didn't know. They've opened a, uh, a door at the back, leading through an old uh, hotel particularly into uh, Rue Franck Bourgeois. As I just tried to open it then, it was locked. But at certain points of the day, you can sneak in through that way. But now the Museum of Art and History of Judaism. The Musée d'Art et d'Histoire du Judaïsme, which is uh, apparently 10 euros to get in. I've never been there. It's up on Rue du Temple, and uh, I think it's time to visit it for the first time. I'll jump on the bike and head over there. Now, incidentally, right as I was about to cycle to the Museum of Art, I bumped into someone else who I've known a long time in Paris, Karen Rebrudel, who uh, also, it, weirdly enough, she was doing a Jewish tour of the Marais when I bumped into her, and she said, Oliver, and I said, Karen, and I interrupted the tour, actually. I said, uh, are you giving a Jewish tour of Paris? She said, yes, I am. I've done one every day this week. And I said, well, I wonder if you wouldn't mind just uh, filling me on on a few blanks that I have before I go to my next stop. And she said, give me a minute to finish the tour and then we'll sit down and have a cold drink and talk it over. So what you're about to hear is Karen Rebrudel from Sightseekers Delight. And after that chat, I'll be off to the Jewish Art and History Museum. So 
tell me who you are. And My name's Karen Reb Rudell, and I own Sight Seekers Delight. And, you're Jewish as well. and I am Jewish, and I've been giving a Jewish tour for 13 years. Four to five times per week, and virtually over 30,000 Jews have watched my program when COVID happened. So I am gently suckling on the bosom of all the Jewish women of America. Wow, that's a thought. <laughs> uh, let's talk. Let's. Uh, it's funny. I just bumped into you on the street while you were doing a Jewish tour of the Marriott. Um, just before I press record, you said to me, "Oliver, as a non-Jew, it's important." I yes. said, "Wait, wait, wait." Can you do that sentence yes. again? Oliver, it's very important that non-Jews understand and comprehend the Jewish neighborhood because the heights of anti-Semitism today are very scary. Over 200,000 Jews have left France in 13 years because of anti-Semitism. So the Jews aren't called the wandering people for nothing. We're still wondering where we can go and be who we want to be. When you say wandering, you mean wandering with an O or an A? Both. Ah. <laughs> the Jews are called the wandering people, but we're still wondering yes. where can we go and be Word who we want to be. Wordplay. Very good. Okay. So I've just, uh, I bumped into you halfway through my own self-guided tour right. of Jewish Paris, which I, I, I want to add, like, one of my favorite things in Paris is, like I always say, it's great to flanner around. But at the same time, it's great to have some kind of purpose that's a bit different so that you can walk down the same streets you walked a billion times and see it differently, which is exactly what I'm doing today. Um, do, you, do you feel like, uh, like for someone like me doing this kind of walk, what are the important things that I don't miss? Well, the important things are the plaques on the walls, and the French don't want to do the stumbling stones. So in other parts of Europe, they have stones called, they're called stropple stones. So they're in Prague, Amsterdam, uh, Venice, and there's a stone in the ground showing you where somebody Jewish was taken away. Okay, that's these. And apparently the French felt that it wasn't really nice to step on the memory. So, you know, there's a lot of deliberation about that. That's why you'll see plaques on the wall. But you also have to remember a lot of these plaques, like the park, the Joseph Minuret Park right there, uh, that was not inaugurated until 2015. So we also have to remember that, A, the French did save three-quarters of their Jews, today being August 24th, the day of the liberation. Um, but the amnesia is slowly wearing off, and they are starting to apologize. Every child in this country will go to the Holocaust Museum. The United States does not have 25 states teaching Holocaust education. With... And uh, we talked about this before I pressed record. It's, it's a... It's, it's a for an entertaining podcast, this topic is very quickly to get into an educational, uh, very somber and sobering uh, kind of kind of angle here. But I want to touch on it a little bit. That that I think a lot of people maybe have already forgotten or never knew how complicit French police were in the deportation of Jewish people. How is that like today? To, you know, a French. What's what's the vibe on that? Well, the joke. The, the, you have to remember that many Jewish people are comedians. You know, we have a lot of, you know, without us, Hollywood, you know, comedy wouldn't exist as far as we're concerned. Um, and all a lot of the great directors. You know, this is where we're coming from. Mel Brooks, perfect example. If we don't laugh, we're going to be crying the whole time. And that's why when I give my Jewish tour, I say I'm going to throw a lot of jokes in because we all have been dealing with this for you know basically five thousand years. So, the, so is that something that a lot of people here, a lot of Jewish people in Paris are sort of uh, living with a laugh? Or is that because you're American? Well, or? I mean, obviously, no, there's plenty of, you know, God, uh, Emlach, you know, he's like the Seinfeld of French Jews. Uh, there's plenty of French Jewish comedians on TV, you know, David Timzit, you know, plenty of Jewish comedians. But they're more Sepharad. Okay, so we have different kinds of Jews. We have Ashkenazis, and that would be anybody with... Coop and Weiss and Bergenstein and Rose and Golden follow it. the bagels and cream cheese, Eastern European Jews. Those are most of the Jews that you lost during World War II here. The Jews of France today are Sepharad, meaning they're coming from Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. So it's the same religion. They just eat a lot better and they look a little more dark skinned. Why do they eat a little better? Explain that one. So they're allowed to eat different things on Passover than the Ashkenazis are. Okay, so the Ashkenazis, this is new to me really. Right. And so, I, are you Ashkenazi? I am Ashkenazi. Is it, like, like I said, it's new. Um, is it wrong to ask people? Uh, is that a. No, it's no. important. No, an Ashkenazi Jew, it's where you come from. Okay, so. Well, even but it's asking anyone where they come from is fraught with danger these days. <laughs> right, it's not so easy, but. It's obvious for many, for Jews, we, we can tell because we know 
you know, the, the guys from Las Falafel, they're Tunisian Israelis. Okay, so most of those boys, and you can tell how they look, look a little different than me. You know, so um, it's, a, it's a skin tone, darker hair, darker eyes. And in, and in Paris, do the different Jewish communities get on? Yeah, now, because it's a little intermarriage, you know, it's not really so much of a separatist's. You know, um, the guys you're seeing on the on the street are the Chabad. There's different levels of Judaism. So I stopped and talked to one of them, and uh, used a lot of words I didn't know. Sure. Uh, but, then, but then I sat with you now, and and we started talking about Friday night to Saturday. Shabbat, Shabbat. right. How do you right. spell it? S H A B B A T. Shabbat. So is that like Sabbath? Yes, yeah, Sabbath. Exactly. It, where, where you come from is what you call it. Good Shabbos or good Shabbat, and that's different between Ashkenazi and Sephardi. Huh. And yeah. you were mentioning because uh, one of my l- lifelong goals for the past week has been has been to get into the synagogue on the Rue Pavé, Ecto Gima. I've been a fan of Ecto Gima for ages. Right. Have you have you been inside? Oh yeah, I used to. I used to get in there until all the crazy terrorist stuff started, and they it was the French police who said you can't let people rolling in in and out of these shuls. Right. It's never been easy to be chosen. We'd like it if you choose somebody else next time. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. You know, so, but that's a joke. I mean, I we're, get it. we're <laughs> happy to be chosen. <laughs> I'm with you. But tell me, how do I get in there? Who do I? Who's uh... to get in there? You'd have to probably wait outside and see if somebody will let you come in. As a, you can say, I'm a reporter. I'm doing a thing. That's my usual. That's my usual you know. strategy. Right. I mean, it's not always easy because. We've been afraid for many years. So you could be a spy, you could be a terrorist. You know, I'm saying we don't know who's who. That's why the Marais is the most well protected area of Paris. There's cameras everywhere. If you know where to look, you know where to look. You know, so. Big Brother is watching. Always. Okay, so what about this museum? I go there, is there something I should be looking for? Is there a way to visit well, the museum? Well, you can, well, the museum is, you know, you can pay to go in and it's amazing. You'll learn a lot about the Jewish history in France. Uh, from the beginning of time when Jews first settled in France, why the Jews settled in France, and the different kinds of Jews we have here. So you would see the outfits that are different, the some of the Judaica, which would be the thing we hang on our door, which is a mezuzah, which you should see in the Marais if you haven't recognized yet. The it's a little bar that goes on the door, and it protects our home. There's one outside the Las Falafel, um, and it has a scroll inside. And you're supposed to touch it every time you go into a Jewish home. You know what's, what's interesting is I think the people who will be listening to us chatting right now around the world, some of them will be going, yep, 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 this is obvious. Others will be going, no idea. I've never You've heard, never heard that before. Absolutely. And, and I think the common ground and everything is bringing it back to Paris, uh, which is a good segue into, we're talking about Shabbat. You say it? Say it? Shabbat. Okay, I swear the guy in the street said it with a bit more of a... Shabbos. Yeah, maybe. But... Um, but uh, you said that's why the last two falafel is closed on Saturday. Exactly. So people walking down the Rue de Rosier on Saturday. That's... And they don't know that uh, that it's a kosher place. They're going to be surprised it's closed. What you know. about what about to wind things up? Um, I'm going to go to the, the art museum now. Then I was thinking to head to maybe to the deportation, deportation and memorial Shoah. and the Shoah Museum. Um, you mentioned before that's something it's made to. Right, the the deportation memorial. It's pointed, and when you go, you know, it's the tip of the island of the Ile de la Cité, and uh, they constructed it there so you would feel when you go down the stairs that what what it was like to be constricted and not be able to leave a camp. So uh, it's important that people learn because it'd be a sad religion to melt away, sure. you know. Well, here I am doing uh, my bit to promote. And the, that's very important. The, the more non-Jews that learn about Jewish history, the more important the understanding of the way the world is right now. Well, I aim to learn and to educate. That's my plan. Is it kosher? That is totally kosher. Karen, thanks for your time. No problem. So I just arrived into the lovely courtyard of the Museum of Jewish Art and History, this 17th century Hôtel Particulier, like a, I don't know, grand old townhouse, one of the one of the few in the Marais. And just a side note, because uh, I've never been in here before, as you get into the courtyard, the whole south-facing wall is nothing but a facade built for symmetry. So when you come to this museum, <laughs> firstly, exceptional doors, massive green double doors with a face bigger than a human face, uh, but a really beautiful courtyard. 
it was worth it for the courtyard alone. I'll pop in and then give you guys an update at the end about everything. So after I visited the museum, let's give it its proper name now that I'm sitting down in French, it's Musée d'Art et d'Histoire du Judaïsme. In English, the Museum of Jewish Art and History. So after I visited it, I went to the Shoah Memorial, and I'm going to sort of summarize these two uh, for everybody thinking to visit. Now, first, the Art Museum. What? It, firstly, the, the building itself is incredible. Uh, just an incredible building. They do a really good job as well, and I think this is important. Same with the Shoah Memorial that I'll talk about in a second, of putting things in English. So many museums in Paris, and fair enough, we're in France, I hear you, I hear what you're thinking, but it's really nice if you're an English speaker to have some of the signs in English, and they did a great job with that, so that's always a quick thumbs up from me. But what I found particularly interesting about the art museum was that it had, uh, it gave me a new perspective on Paris as well, in unexpected ways, as usual with every museum that I seem to go to. Because it has ancient objects. I mean, it has some gravestones that were century, like many, many, many centuries old from graveyards that have uh, long since vanished. But they, they tell the story of how they discovered them. But gravestones with Hebrew uh, inscriptions on them. And then uh, they also have like modern art, which weirdly, I also I, I happened to cycle past the Pompidou Museum. And I had heard that it's closing for five years for renovation. So I, I'd been meaning to jump in. I slipped in there and I found myself, which is one of the cool things living in Paris. You find yourself just staring at one artist's work or one piece of work. You don't necessarily have to feel like you have to see everything in the museum when you live here because you can always go to more. And I found myself staring at the work by Marc Chagall. I don't know why it really just spoke to me. I didn't even know if he was Jewish or not. I didn't even think about it. And then when I went to the Jewish museum, there's more work from him. And it was one of those moments where I was like, oh, everything's coming together. I'm understanding. I'm understanding. So they've got all kinds of things in there, especially upstairs. Oh, the rain has started. You can tell I'm on the top floor in Paris. Now you all feel like you're here too. Uh, then uh, the top floor has all these objects, fascinating objects, things like uh, jewelry and crowns, and they've got ancient arm boxes, for example. They've got uh, Renaissance paintings, uh, and there's a whole room dedicated to the holiday of Hanukkah, including all sorts. In fact, there were so many, I didn't even know what half of the objects were. I was just uh, consistently learning all day. Torahs, one big, beautiful silver Torah that I took a picture of. Uh, from the Ottoman Empire, I believe. Uh, from there, got back on my bike, headed down to the Shoah Memorial. Now, this is a weird one for me because it's really close to the Peloton Cafe. And yet, I mean, really close. This is somewhere I've been, the Peloton, I've been there probably 50,000 times, I'd say. And yet, I never went inside the Shoah Memorial. And I think there's two reasons behind it. Firstly, uh, it's so heavily guarded that if you don't, stop and ask i say heavily guarded there's security out the front and there's big gates make it look like a prison or like an embassy or something you know like it feels like they don't want you to get in which is obviously because of anti-semitic attacks and that kind of stuff but uh it wasn't it's never been very welcoming and so i've never felt i've never just felt like popping in secondly i'll admit didn't know what the word show was didn't really know what was going on in the museum and never thought to look it up so uh, fortunately for me, being in a learning mode for this episode, I'd looked it up while I was researching this episode before Edith mentioned it. And uh, Shoah, not meaning the Holocaust, but it's like meaning like the great catastrophe. And hence this memorial, which is very beautifully done, very somber and elegant and, and uh, I mean, very harrowing as well. It's a memorial to everything that happened uh, during the Holocaust. So you go in, one of the first things you see is this big wall of names, names of all the Jewish people from Paris who died in the war. And then when you go in, it's like if you've ever been to Auschwitz in Poland, really similar kind of like pictures from Auschwitz, uh, kind of like just, uh, just hard to even look at. I mean, it's... It's one of those, uh, you know, like the pictures where there's just a massive 
pile of reading glasses or suitcases or something like that from the Nazi camps and um, they just done it really beautifully. So it's a free museum to enter. If you want to expand your mind a bit and learn about uh, what happened in the Second World War in Paris or if you just want to see a very different side of Paris, it's a recommended viewing, I'd say, the Shoah Memorial. Now, uh, this leads us back to the falafel restaurant. Now, oh my goodness me, I don't think I've ever had so much effort for two minutes of interview. Uh, I went back after uh, the first time on Sunday, as the plan was, to meet one of the owners who had just been in his family for a long time. I went back three times, and the staff all really pleasant with me. But uh, goodness me, it wasn't easy. And when I finally met with Yumi, he said to me, uh, I don't speak English. It felt kind of like the way that uh, I had to get to him felt like I was meeting a celebrity, not least because I've seen all these pictures of him with all these famous people who've come to his restaurant. So I'm finally with him and uh, he says he doesn't speak English. And I almost said, it's not worth it then. But then I figured I'd let him speak French and do a bit of a translation for you. So here is what happened when I met him out the front of the restaurant, starting in French, finishing with my translation. Uh, bonjour, je suis Monsieur Perret, le gérant de l'As du Falafel, okay. qui a été créé en 1979. Okay, et mon première question, c'est assez populaire, c'est hyper populaire ici. Pourquoi Alors, d'abord, c'est nous qui avons euh, les premiers euh, en 1979 amené le Falafel en France. Les gens ne connaissaient pas le Falafel ici. Voilà, et donc euh, après, ce qui fait la différence entre nous et les autres, bon, il y a l'accueil, il y a l'atmosphère, il y a l'ambiance, mais surtout, il y a le goût. We can't very well have a podcast in French. Let me translate, roughly translate, every single thing that he said. He introduced himself as Monsieur Peretz. His name is Yomi Peretz. And uh, he said, we created this place in 1979. We brought the falafel. We put falafel on the map in France. No one knew about it. But I asked him what separates them from the other, why it's so popular. He said, we have the welcome. We have the atmosphere, the ambience. But also we have the taste. He said that it's a, a recipes passed down through generations from grandparents in Israel. And he says it's not just uh, that that gives them the reputation compared to the others, but it's the quality and, and a reasonable price. But that's why they're well known in the Marais and popular around the world. I, I asked him a question that could have gone deep, but it didn't. I, I asked him about uh, Jewishness and how much that identity is important to them. And he said, he said it is important, but it's, uh, it's not just a restaurant for Jewish people. He said that maybe 35% of the customers are Jewish uh, nowadays, and it's more something that's been taken over from uh, the whole world, people that come to visit. And I sort of got onto this whole uh, celebrity thing. He said, we were helped enormously by Lenny Kravitz, who's been coming for 30 years. He told Rolling Stone in it, like the magazine in an interview that it was his favorite place in Paris and it kicked something off. He said that's why they have a Lenny Kravitz quote out the front and I asked him what did Lenny order or what does he what does he order and apparently it's the falafel special with carrot juice. So I took well I didn't take the carrot juice but I took the falafel special and a shawarma on the next day. I felt like Lenny Kravitz. I just want to point out Often when restaurants say that um, some famous person mentioned them or whatever, often, you know, it's just the, the, the famous person was in the restaurant and they snapped a picture with it. But when you Google it, Kravitz, I mean, he doesn't shut up about this place. If he's, he's, whenever he talks about Paris, he talks about uh, Last to Falafel. So this is legit. And I wonder, um, I wonder if it's because of him that all the other celebrities are coming. But hey, you don't have to be a celebrity to go there. But interesting to know that Lenny Kravitz started a falafel revolution. I realize now I didn't mention the guy blowing the, uh, the horn. Let, they let me follow them up to the, uh, to the synagogue, the oldest synagogue, which is kind of cool. It was uh, they were really welcoming, and I got to see a room where they pray up there with a really magnificent old library sort of reading room with books on the wall. It was really pretty. I took pictures. I'll share that too. As for the synagogue designed by Hector Guima, who we featured in a recent episode, the architect, I called him again and tried to get in, and they just said forget it. 
And uh, it's easy as me, the, the, the journalist or the podcaster, the storyteller, to get frustrated about not being able to get into some of these beautiful ancient buildings. But on a more sensitive reflection, I can totally understand why they don't let people go into these places willy-nilly given all that's happened and all that you've heard about um, in the history of Jews in Paris and around the world. Fair enough, I would also be, be careful about who I was letting into my synagogue. But Hector Guimard eludes me again. That will do for this episode of The Earful Town. I realize sometimes there might be someone listening for the first time ever. They get all the way to the end of the episode and they wonder, why did I say J is for Jewish Paris at the start? It's because I'm doing the A to Z, the A to Z of uh, France and Paris, where I'm picking a topic for each letter. And then uh, sort of randomly, but also sort of uh, driven by things that I'm curious about, topics rather than interviewing people, and uh, J happened to be for Jewish Paris. K, no one's ever going to guess K because it's way out of left field. And if you want to get your guesses in on social media, I'd say you better make it snappy. That's maybe a clue. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? If you want to see this show thrive, if you want a lot of extras, including videos, uh, become a Patreon member. Patreon.com slash the Earful Tower. You may have noticed that I don't stuff adverts down your throat like so many other podcasts do. That's because I rely on patrons. For 10 bucks a month, you get all kinds of specials. For example, uh, this episode's coming out on Monday morning. 24 hours before this episode was released, I was walking around the Ile Saint-Louis with a camera doing a live video. Last week's topic was Ile Saint-Louis, and I was showing everybody the beautiful island before all the Parisians and tourists got there. We got into a beautiful courtyard uh, behind that big, beautiful green door that I talked about. Someone sent me the code, so I went right into the sundial at the back. These are the things you're missing out on if you're not a member, so I highly encourage you to sign up. Or sign up for the whole year and get two months for free. Patreon.com slash The Earful Tower. My name's Oliver G. This is The Earful Tower. Remember to check the show notes below for how to find more about Press Maxon, Edith de Belleville and Karen Rebrudel. Even for the restaurants and the synagogues that I mentioned, it's all down in the show notes. That will do for me. Merci beaucoup and au revoir.